Welcome to the installation workshop. In this section, we're gonna look at three different stations. An attic insulation station, an air sealing station, and a wall insulation station. This assembly is the attic insulation station. Here, we're gonna look at issues with knee walls, thermal bypasses, and improper installation of insulation. The first thing we wanna talk about when we're working in an attic is safety. When we're working with insulation in an attic, we always wanna have safety glasses or goggles, a respirator, and long sleeves, especially if we don't know what kind of insulation we're gonna be working with. The other thing we wanna make sure that we always do is stay on the roof rafters. We never wanna step directly on the ceiling material, whether that be plaster or drywall, because that's the quickest way to the floor below. This is our knee wall. It separates interior conditioned living space from our attic space. In this knee wall, we have three bays, each with a problem with the insulation. This first bay obviously doesn't have any insulation at all. The next bay, even though it has insulation, the insulation is poorly installed. As you can see, we have gaps at the top as well as bunching in the insulation itself. In our last bay, we have insulation. It's pretty well installed, but on closer examination, we'll notice that the craft paper is actually installed to the exterior and should be installed to the interior to provide some moisture protection for the insulation itself. So let's fix that. Now we're gonna take a look at the thermal bypass that happens between a floor assembly and an attic knee wall. Down below, we can see the air gap between the ceiling above and the subfloor. What happens is the heat from below comes up and warms the air in between these two floors. And because there's no air barrier between this space and the attic space, the air is allowed to escape into the attic and out through the roof vents. So how do we fix that? What we do is we take a plastic bag, which is going to act as our air barrier. We're gonna wrap it around our insulation hose, then stuff that bag into that cavity. Fill it up with cellulose insulation, and it's gonna create a nice tight seal in that cavity. Here we're looking at a typical section of attic insulation. We see cellulose insulation, and we have an attic ruler. Now, an attic ruler will be used by technicians throughout the attic to make sure that they have a nice, even level of insulation. When you inspect an attic, don't rely on these. Make sure you measure it yourself. Now, my tape is saying four inches, even though the attic ruler says six. Why is that? As we take a look at the attic ruler, we notice that the bottom two inches have been cut off. This is a technique that unscrupulous technicians will use to save on materials. Something else a technician may do to cheat is to turn up the air setting on their blowing machine. And what that does is fluffs up the insulation, which means that right after it's installed, it may show 14 inches, but over time, it begins to settle. So make sure when you're doing an inspection to check the bag count, not just the inches. In order to get the insulation into the attic, we need one of these, a portable insulation blowing machine. The insulation goes into the top here into the hopper. At the bottom of the hopper, there's an agitator. And what that agitator does is it breaks up the insulation because the insulation's been packed into a bag and compressed. So in order to get that to flow properly, we need that agitator to break that up. Once that insulation gets broken up by the agitator, then it falls through the gate. The gate actually controls how much material gets 
blown into the house through the hose. Once it falls through the gate, then it goes into the blower. The blower then blows that insulating material through the hose and into the house. Now the technician on the other end of the hose has a remote. And on that remote, they can control both the agitator and the blower. So if they just want air to say, help them flatten out the material that they've already installed, then they'll just run the air. But if they want both air and material, then they'll select agitator on, then they'll get material as well as air out into the attic. Now, the technician will alternate back and forth between just air and having both air and agitator on in order to give a nice, smooth installation of insulating material. Each bag of insulating material has a chart on the side that shows you how many bags you need per thousand square feet to reach a particular R value. It's really important to remember when you're working in an attic to stay on the studs. Once a technician gets into the attic and they place their attic rulers, the next thing they're going to start doing is blowing insulation. They'll use their remote to control the flow of material as well as to make sure that the material is level. Let me show you what that looks like. You'll notice I'm using my hand as a directional. I'm making sure that the material goes where I want it to go, and I'm keeping the dust down by putting my hand in front of the nozzle. Now the technician's gonna stop periodically and check their work, just to make sure that it's level, it's even, they're putting enough material in, <clears throat> and not too much, and to make sure they're not over fluffing. So we're out about six inches right here. So what the technician would do, if we're going up to 14 inches, if it calls for 14 inches, then we go to about seven and a half inches in an area, make sure we were nice and flat, then go on up to the finished 14 inches, then move to the next spot in the attic and do the same thing. This is our wall blow station. Here we'll demonstrate how to get insulation into a finished exterior wall. The first thing we do is drill a hole in the finished wall, either from the interior or from the exterior. The next thing we do is insert the fill tube into the hole, going up until we hit the top plate. Once we get it to the top plate, then we're going to back it off about a foot. The next step, start filling it with insulation. Okay, so what's going to happen is we have material that's going to the top and we're not actually filling from the top. That material, as you can see, is falling down to the bottom. So as we fill, fill up material, we can actually feel the pressure change in the hose. So then we'll move our hose down a little bit more. Okay, so we just want to make sure that we don't have a blowout. Take our last little material, fill it up in this hole right here. And it looks like we have a pretty good dense pack. And let's take a look. Looks like we have a pretty good dense pack. You'll notice that when we opened up the sheeting, the cellulose dense packed into this cavity didn't fall out. This is one of the advantages of a dense packed cellulose material. It'll actually fill in gaps around piping and wiring to give us a nice, even, filled cavity. We have to be careful though 
because as we fill these cavities, it puts pressure on the sheeting and the interior finished material, the drywall, the plaster, maybe even paneling. And if we're not careful, we can easily blow that finished material right off the wall. You'll notice the cellulose in the other cavities. One of the things that gives cellulose a good air sealing property is that it tends to fill in any gaps between framing members. So that's why we have insulation in the other cavities because the cellulose has made its way through those breaks in the building framing members. This is the air sealing station. We'll be looking at attic access hatches, roof penetrations, recess can lights, and drop soffits, looking at both the issues and solutions that are commonly associated with these building elements. This is a drop soffit. Typically, you'll find one of these in a bathroom with can lights installed in it or in a kitchen above uppers. The problem with a drop soffit is it's typically framed before the wall board goes up. As a result, there's no cap on the top of it and no insulation on the inside. What that does is it allows the heat from the interior space to come through the uninsulated walls, make its way into the attic and out to the outside. There are two ways we go about fixing that. The first is to cover the top of the drop soffit from the attic and insulate over the top of it, making sure that it's air sealed very well. The second way to fix that problem is to actually insulate the walls inside the drop soffit. So imagine this is an interior wall, say the, the plumbing wall that your sink is up against, and it's radiating heat into this drop soffit, and that heat is leaving. We fix that by taking some fiberglass insulation, rolling it up really tight or burritoing it, and stuffing it into that hole. Now the air that's underneath, although it's being warmed by the house, cannot make its way into this drop soffit and out into the rest of the world. Now let's talk about the flue chase. A flue chase is a vertical empty column that goes from the furnace all the way up to the attic and it contains the flue pipe for the furnace and the water heater. That's a problem because it allows conditioned air to move freely from the basement area all the way to the attic uncontested. So how do we fix that? We can't simply put plywood around it. We have to put metal because of the heat of the flue pipe. So we cut the metal the right size Cut a hole in the metal, tack it down on the sides, and then caulk around the edges using fire caulk. When we're looking at recessed can lights, the main thing we're looking for is whether or not they're IC rated. IC means insulation contact. If you were to bring insulation in direct contact with a non-IC rated light, it would overheat and consequently shut off. If we look at a non-IC rated can, we'll also notice some other things about it. We'll notice that it has air holes and vents that allow the heat from the light bulb to escape. The problem with those holes is that they also allow warm air from your home to escape along with it. If we look at an IC rated can, however, we'll notice that that can is completely sealed and it disperses its heat in a much more efficient way. Plus, it doesn't let heat from the inside of the house escape. So how do we go about insulating a non-IC rated can? We're gonna build what's called a top hat out of this flashing material. We take and wrap the flashing material on itself, bend up the tabs, put the flashing over the can light, then fire caulk all the way around the tabs, then take another piece of flashing, put it over the top, and seal it with duct mastic. 
Now we can insulate right up to the top hat. The can will stay cool and will stay warm. Air sealing ceiling fixtures, once you find them, is really quite simple. You simply clear away the insulation, run a bead of foam in the air gap, and put the insulation back in place. When wind blows in a soffit vent, it tends to blow the insulation away from the exterior wall. That's why we use these. This is an insulation baffle. When that wind blows in the soffit vent, it blows over the top of this, allowing the insulation to stay in place. Two problems we run into with the attic access hatch are no insulation on the top and inadequate air sealing along the edge. We can fix that by attaching either rigid foam or a bat of insulation to the top side and adding weather stripping along the edge. Another problem that we see in the attic are interior divider walls. We see a lot of air leakage where the wall board meets the framing member, so we want to make sure those get nice and sealed. Before we blow any insulation, we want to make sure that all of our air sealing is done. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves digging through freshly blown insulation to do our caulking. 